punkten med programpunkten Vinna kriget, vinna freden. Det är Ian Burma som ska, har släppt en bok som handlar om händelserna efter 1945. Jag välkomnar upp på scen Björn Linnell från Natur och kultur och Ian Burma, professor i mänskliga rättigheter och journalistik vid Bard College i New York. Eh, Eh, lycka till med samtalet. Tackar, tackar. Och välkomna. En varm applåd för mina ja. deltagare på scenen. Uh, now Ian, uh, you've written about the first, what happened immediately after the war, immediately in your book, Year Zero. But when I read that book, I had a, I had a vision that some of the things you describe is happening now. It's, 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 it's people moving across borders, fleeing from war, trying to find shelter somewhere. How do, you, how do you see the sort of the similarities? Well, I mean, of course, people have always been moving across borders, and we've had waves of refugees before. Uh, the Hungarians have conveniently forgotten that in 1956 there were hundreds of thousands of Hungarians um, refugees as well, and the Vietnamese boat people and so on. One big difference is that in 1945, m many of the refugees were Germans from Poland and Czechoslovakia, and very few people felt any sympathy for them, uh, considering what the Germans had done to others. Um, there were other similarities. Uh, perhaps the greatest scandal of 1945 was the way that um, Russians, Cossacks, white Russians, uh, Russian slave laborers, uh, Russian uh, workers who'd been taken to, to Germany and so on were sent back to the Soviet Union uh, and people, the allies, knew that they would probably end up in camps in Siberia or be shot. But then, just as now, um, many governments, including the British government, really didn't want these people. I mean, they would be a burden. Uh, refugees are never very popular. Immigrants are even less popular. And yet we need them. Uh, our societies are graying, um, we're not producing enough children, uh, we need the fresh blood, and um, many of the Syrians, of course, are well educated and probably will be a great advantage to uh, European countries. But that's harder for people to see than the, the short-term emotion that is evoked by photographs of children being drowned and that sort of thing. Uh, the title is, from this seminar is uh, gain, w Winning the War or Losing the Peace or something. Uh, uh, but how would you describe, we pretend to see the end of the war as now. Everything's fine. Now the, the Nazis have been beaten, the, the Japanese in, 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 in August. How do you, what, what really happened after the war? What, how do you describe it? Well, one reason I wrote the book about 1945 is that I felt a lot of the people who were promoting the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, for example, the neoconservatives in the United States, were too young to have any personal memories of the war. And they did not understand that even a just war, and the war against Hitler's Third Reich was certainly a just war, still produce catastrophes. They tear societies apart, uh, they create millions of people who lose their homes, uh, they cause civil wars, revenge, and so on. And so it's never so simple that you just topple a dictatorship and then things will be okay. It's never okay, um, even in wars that have to be fought. And so I described in that book all the disasters that happened because after 1945, um, uh, all the things I just mentioned. Uh, what, what strikes me when I read, read the book is that it, the violence continues. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there, there's a violence against the, uh, the, the Germans, of course, or against Jews returning home. Things that you thought that they would, the, the victims would at least be sort of taken with, with, uh, with consideration. But they seem to be c continually threatened. Well, I think that when you see revenge or violence on a large scale, it's almost always politically manipulated. In India, uh, during partition in 1947, there was tremendous violence between the Muslims and the Hindus, people who'd lived together often peacefully for centuries. This could not have happened without a lot of political uh, 
manipulation. The violence in the Balkans uh, by the Serbs in Bosnia and so on was clearly politically motivated. That doesn't mean that there aren't popular feelings of hostility that can be whipped up, but they have to be whipped up. Um, and I think that was true in 1945 as well. A lot of the violence uh, against the German populations in Poland and Czechoslovakia was partly ethnic against and, and revenge for what the Nazis had done. It was also a class war. It was a revolutionary class war. The Germans in cities in uh, East Prussia and the Sudetenland were the middle class. They were the professors, the doctors, the lawyers, uh, and the people who committed the violence were often villagers, uh, workers, and so on. So, and that was deliberately stirred up by the communist parties. So um, it, 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 it's very rarely spontaneous. Uh, you, you, you describe also what's happened in Asia, uh, which is also I th find very interesting with your book that you can, con you can compare not only, not only Europe, what happened on that scene, but also the, the Asian scene. But the funny thing, what I didn't understand was how when the, when the Japanese soldiers came back, they were treated with, with, with distaste, with, 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 with hate. Why? How come? How they, they just fought for their country? Well, soldiers who have lost a war are never very popular. Um, they're popular as long as they win a war, but uh, losers are never popular. I mean, soldiers who came back from the Vietnam War in the United States were treated with disdain as well and called baby killers and so on. Um, but uh, the, one must remember how demoralized um, the, especially the men were in Germany and Japan after the war. They bullied uh, the, the, the civilians for a long time uh, and while they were winning they got away with that. When they actually lost the war and, and, and left their countries in ruins, uh, of course they were the least popular members of society. Um, and um, so it, it, one result was that it completely changed the dynamics between men and women. It, in Germany, it was the women who were stronger than the men after the war. They'd had to take care of their families. Um, they had to keep things going. And these, these men who came back from Russia and other places were, were wrecks. Uh, you mentioned that, that some of the... I mean, Japan also after the war was... was they grow up uh, sort of organized crimes, gangs, and that many of the, of the members of these gangs were actually ex-soldiers, officers and so on. How, I mean, this, this, you, you, the army used to be a sort of a very hierarchical and moral force. Well, the army was abolished in Japan, and um, it's always a problem in every war when you have uh, masses of fighting men who have been trained to kill, that's their job, and when they come back and there's no longer any killing to be done, that's the only skill they have. And so you always have a problem of how to reintegrate soldiers into civilian society after a war. The other thing is that law creates a vacuum of lawlessness. And when there are a lot of people who are hungry, when the economy is wrecked, uh, the only thing, only organization that can uh, create a market for food and goods and so on is usually the criminal organizations. And, uh, and, th and they uh, offer employment to a large number of men who are very good at violence. Uh, it seems to me that when you, when you read your book, you, there is, you should say that the book is divided into chapters that deals with uh, sort of violence or women and so on. Um, so there's, there's topics that you describe. But it seems that the women are the ones who suffer most, both during the war, but also after the war. Would that be a correct description? Well, the, the, well there was a lot of um, feeling of vengeance in countries that had been occupied by the Nazis against collaborators. And a lot of people who had not been heroic during the war suddenly became very heroic after the war when it came to uh, taking revenge on uh, collaborators. But the, the, collabor the, the ones who suffered most from that revenge were often not the worst collaborators. The people who were at the top of society during uh, the occupation 
very often industrialists, bureaucrats, politicians, and so on. They were needed after the war to build up these countries. They were on the whole left alone. It was um, the people who were easiest to take revenge on that were the main victims immediately after the war. And that was m women who had had German boyfriends during the war, who had soldier boyfriends. The least of uh, crimes, really. But they were the easiest targets and also the most emotional one because uh, men who felt humiliated by defeat and occupation, for them the, most, the, the symbol of their humiliation was the, f the, the sight of their own women um, going out with German soldiers. And so the revenge was partly because it was easy, it was partly because it was very symbolic for the sense of humiliation that had been felt uh, before. Uh, did this happen in China as well? I mean, there was a lot of Chinese women who were taken by the Japanese to brothels and so on. Did, did the Chinese also take revenge on their, on their women? No, I think less, partly because the women who were in the brothels were not collaborators. They were not women who were chosen to have Japanese boyfriends. They were forced to um, be in brothels for the, for the Japanese Imperial Army. There wasn't all that much revenge in China because uh, as soon as the war was over, the attention was no longer on the Japanese, it was on the civil war between Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists and Mao Zedong's communists. That, that was the main conflict after the war. People weren't really all that concerned anymore uh, uh, by the Japanese, even though the Japanese did play a role. Um, a lot of the Japanese officers, uh, military officers, um, were used by Chiang Kai-shek to help him in the civil war against the, the communists. Um, there is uh, one of the categories that, are, uh, that you describe is the returners, the ones who have been uh, fi fighting as soldiers or even the ones who were in con concentration camps and how they are treated when they return. You, you, you use, for example, your own back country, Holland. How would you describe, did, how, did you, how, did they, how were they received when they came back from years of internation in camps? Well, Holland wasn't the worst example. I mean, there were many young Dutch men who were forced to work uh, in the German war industry, and my father was one. But they were integrated, reintegrated into society relatively easily. It was a very different story for the few Jewish survivors. And, of course, when the Jews were deported, their houses, their property, and so on, was very often taken over by other people very quickly. And when they came back, or some of them came back, very few, but they were not on the whole very welcome, especially when they wanted their old properties back. And this happened all over Europe. The other thing is that people very rarely welcome uh, people who have had worse experience than you had. So people didn't want to hear what happened to the Jews in concentration camps and death camps. Um, when a Jew came back to a country like Holland, if they wanted to talk about their experience at all, which was rarely the case, it had been so horrible that most people w remained silent. But if they did say something, the locals who'd stayed back and who'd had much, whose experience was, was much less bad would immediately say, well, you don't understand how badly we suffered too. Uh, the Germans took my bicycle and that kind of thing. <laughs> so, um, uh, yes. Uh, People are rarely welcome when they come back from, from terrible experiences. When you decide to be written about the, the, the war, the war guilt in Japan and, and Germany before, uh, but what, was there anything when you were writing this book that you thought, ah, oh, I didn't understand that, I've never understood this. I see, so you see something new when you, when, when you were traveling, working with this book. Did you see something new? It's very difficult to say because once you've done the research, and you've written the book, you forget what you knew and what you didn't know. Um, I suppose one aspect that I, uh, I learned from by doing research was how quickly the Cold War uh, influenced events uh, in Europe. And one way that that was played out, and you especially saw that in countries like Italy and Greece, but also in France, was how people who'd collaborated uh, with the elites who had collaborated with the Germans during the war were often brought back uh, into political and public life. And those who, very often communists or people on the, on the left, who'd resisted 
the Nazi occupation had to be crushed. And that left um, resentments that influence politics to this day. You see that in Italy, uh, but you, and, and especially in Greece. With the current crisis, economic crisis in Greece, we see how quickly you see the rise of a far-right neo-Nazi party. You see the rise of the far left, and those wounds have never really healed. And uh, when we look upon the war, we see it as a sort of easy. It's, it's the good, the good guys and the bad guys. Um, what, when, when did this, did this, did this still linger on? And, and, and do you think do we do we still? Is still the sort of the popular picture that the, the Nazis, the, the Germans were to blame, the Japanese were to blame, as a people almost. Is that is that a picture that you think thinks that? Well, there? it was very pleasant to grow up in Holland as I did in the 50s and 60s, and feel that you were one of the good guys. <laughs> that gave one a very pleasant and warm feeling. Um, as you grow up, of course, you start to see these things in more relative terms, and I, I am a firm believer that. Um, most bad guys, if in changed circumstances, can become good guys, just as good guys in different circumstances can become get bad guys, and that in bad circumstances, the truly bad guys are relatively few, the truly good guys are relatively few, and most people just try to survive. Uh, the book is, is about different topics, as we said. It is a very brutal book. Because the history, it is very sort of, there are not many, many light things. It would, would you say there's anything that sort of gives a hope after the war? Well, there was hope because after catastrophe, there's also often a period of, 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 of creation, of, of um, uh, reconstruction and so on. And there was an enormous atmosphere all over the world of um, idealism in 1945, the idea that after this disaster we have to, have to build a better world that's more equal and so on. So there was a, 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 a strong um, swing to the left everywhere. One of the things that I found in my research for this book was an American army magazine written by US soldiers, four US soldiers called Yank. And the politics of the army magazine were far to the left of the Democratic Party in the U.S. today. And Winston Churchill, the great war hero, was w voted out of office in August 1945, but, or July, I think it was, before the war with Japan had even ended. Not because people didn't admire him as a war hero, but people wanted a change. And, and a lot of the things that we grew up with, I mean, our generation, with the welfare states, with internationalism, with... Uh, European unification and so on, all came from that wave of idealism uh, that came after the war, which is now, uh, I think, over. I think there's very little left of that idealism, um, and I hope we won't need another war uh, to revive it, because we might not survive it. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ian, a warm applause. We have to stop now. Thank you. But Ian will be here signing the book. You can buy the book and you can sign it. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being so many. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian. I hope you have a nice uh, book.